projects. They've kind of, they're kind of probably the most well-known one if you want to check them out. Um, but carbon, soil carbon sequestration is basically what we need to do. All the stuff with the big fans and, you know, the pumps. And, you know, if you've seen that, <laughs> that thing in Sweden or Switzerland or whatever where they have the, you know, they basically suck carbon dioxide out of the air with, like, giant fans and, like, put it into the ground where it just comes back out anyway. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's like a bad joke. I mean, when I saw that, I was like, what are you <laughs> using a massive amount of energy when you could just be taking your trash and throwing it on a field, literally? <laughs> um, so geoengineering uh, or, you know, stuff like that um, is something that is very risky. I mean, basically, we're already geoengineering with climate change. So we're, we're, you know, we're, we're geoengineering by pumping out massive amounts of greenhouse gases. Um, but this is like a very reckless and uncontrolled type of geoengineering. However, most types of geoengineering would probably be quite reckless because it's very hard to predict uh, how the planet will respond to things that we haven't seen before. So like if we were to, you know, say launch a bunch of mirrors into outer space, you know, to reflect, that would probably be, you know, close to okay, but you know, what if something happens to those mirrors? What if they fall out of space? Fall out somebody's head? You know, I don't know. You know. There's all kinds of things that people don't consider when they're thinking about geoengineering because they're like, technology will save our problems. And that's, it's really more of a mindset issue than like a, you know, any kind of technological one of, of we can keep doing what we're doing because we enable ourselves because we'll just magically come up with a technology that will solve all of our problems. But we have the things that we already need. We don't need to look for magic solutions like, you know, pumping a bunch of iron fillings into the oceans and causing phytoplankton blooms. You know, somebody just, I don't know if you, several years ago, somebody just, like a rich guy, just went out and bought a bunch of iron shavings and dumped them into the ocean <laughs> to cause a massive phytoplankton bloom, which would, he thought, sequester carbon in the deep oceans. It didn't. And, you know, it kind of messed up that ecosystem for a while and brought in a bunch of iron, which wasn't good, but um, he did it and he did it by himself. And so that's, you know, that may be kind of the future of what we're looking at, you know, just people like Elon Musk or, you know, whatever, I rich, uh, motivated people who are just want to come in and solve problems, <laughs> you know, like building little submarines to get boys out of caves instead of just training them to use the, the things that they need. Um, yeah, I think that's all I had to say about junior engineering. Any, any other questions? Otherwise, we, yeah. Well, considering, I guess, climate change is a global problem, how do we reconcile national sovereignty with this issue of controlling what people do with their... That's, that's, that's that you could teach an entire course about that question, <laughs> trying to answer that question. Um, I mean, on a kind of like the most large scale, it's, it's, a, it's a philosophical, well, like kind of eco-philosophical problem the tragedy of the commons. It's how do you, when you have a common resource, in this case the atmosphere, how do you prevent independent parties from just exploiting it when they don't suffer any immediate consequences? And that's, that's, that's a really tricky problem, you know, that gets into like all kinds of like game theory things and, you know, psycho psychology quirks and stuff like that. But, um, I mean, basically, I mean, I believe you can solve problems through, you know, stuff like this, through education, through real education, not, you know, propaganda <laughs> um, and, you know, politically mo motivated things, but everyone coming to the realization that this is a real problem and we need to figure out how we're going to solve it. Um, because right now, you know, we, we've, we've kind of whiffled and waffled and, you know, been, well, we can kick the ball a little bit down the road, you know, maybe we'll come up with, you know, some giant air pump that we can just suck all the carbon dioxide out with and, you know, we'll be fine. Um, but we can't do that. <laughs> yes, um, yeah, and I, absolutely. So we do a lot of work with indigenous communities and um, it's really uh, shocking to see kind of, you know, I mean, I, I haven't seen so much firsthand, but you know, kind of secondhand, like for right, right now, this class was supposed to have two TAs. I was supposed to be co-teeing it with someone else and they're out uh, at, the, at the Pine Ridge Reservation dealing with the flooding that's happening there. Um, and trying to coordinate with, you know, the, the local leaders out there to, to get in FEMA. Because <laughs> FEMA's like, oh, it's not an emergency. It's no problem. You know, you guys, you literally flooded out of your homes and you have no access to, you know, infrastructure or roadways or anything like that. Um, and this is just prime, a prime example of how indigenous communities are uh, in, in, uh, completely unequally impacted by the effects of climate change. And which is, you know, insane because these are the ones, these are the people that have been trying to stop us from doing all the things that we've done to the planet all along the way, you know. Uh, and 
you know, in places like the Amazon, um, there's, the, there, there's tribes there that are rainforest protectors. You know, they live in the rainforest. They've lived in the rainforest since time immemorial, and they actually increase the biodiversity of the environments that they live in. If you take away the people, the indigenous people from a land, it, it becomes less productive. It becomes less, you know, healthy. <laughs> because people should be an integral part of the land. We should be an integral part of the ecosystem. But, you know, this, this particular mindset that we seem to have gotten into in a Western culture is, you know, we can take as much as we want from the land and, you know, take as much as we want from nature. Um, and we're seeing the consequences of that. We're seeing it, you know, more and more each year. And uh, the, 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 the messages that, you know, the indigenous people of, you know, this continent, South America, of, you know, all the continents have been trying to tell us is that ain't going to work out. <laughs> and it hasn't. So, I mean, you know, I, I don't know if that kind of speaks to your, your question, but yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier about the last great extinction. Um, I know we are currently in the midst of another mass extinction. Um, on like the topic of indigenous lands, I've heard that like a lot of biodiversity is on indigenous lands still, like more than 50% globally. Um, I'm curious, what are the main factors in these extinctions? Like, is it like the habitat loss, the urbanization, or is it? It's it's a it's a combination of things because you know if it if it w basically if it wasn't a combination of a million different factors it probably wouldn't be happening so it's it's things getting hotter you know it's 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 climate change uh, uh, you know or global warming sorry it's things getting hotter it's things getting drier or things getting wetter you know precipitation patterns will shift and we'll go through a lot of this uh, next time you know about what the particular impacts are but um, they become more yeah I, I was mentioning earlier they become more susceptible to disease like plants you know, trees become more susceptible to bark beetle here, you know, when, when they're stressed for water and they're stressed for heat. Uh, and so if you don't have, basically, if you start to, to, you know, flick one domino, they start to come down. And the more you flick, the more, you know, th they start to come down. So um, there's basically just a lot of interconnected things that, it, you know, it's hard to pick out one thing in particular. But land, u land, land, uh, land use changes, so like burning down the Amazon, massive, massive, you know, biodiversity loss there. Um, and, you know, and it never comes back. Like I was mentioning earlier, you know, the rainforest brings the rain. So if you cut down the rainforest, the rain goes away and then the rainforest doesn't come back. <laughs> so basically what I wanted to give you today uh, and, and tomorrow, or sorry, Thursday, um, is, is like a factual underpinning that you can do a lot of these thinking, you know, you can do a lot of these analyses uh, yourself. But we're also going to be covering it, you know, more stuff like that in the class. So you'll see where the roots of all this came from, you know, where, where these particular mindsets arose from, the particular people that they came from. Um, uh, so this is, that's a um, very politically, you know, tricky question to answer because a lot of the times the, the less developed countries are the ones that are more affected by climate change as well. So, you know, they're like, well, you know, you guys messed everything up, so now we have to develop really quickly so that we don't just die out when the constant, when, you know, your chickens come home to roost for us. So, uh, it is a very tricky question, and you know, s particularly for some place like India yeah. or China, you know, where they're they're building more coal plants <laughs> when we can't build any new coal plants. And but they're like, well, you know, our people are poor and they're they're starving and they're suffering, and you know, they're g it's going to get worse. You know, what are we supposed to do? Basically, it needs to be countries like us that change first. And the fact that we are so stubborn as a country about changing, and we have done. Uh, there's a, a sign reading. Um, about the Paris Agreement that I, uh, that I recommend um, uh, that, you know, made me tear up because I was just so frustrated reading it. Because, you know, it's exactly this kind of thing of, of the most privileged, wealthiest countries in the world who are most responsible for climate change are the ones that are like, no, 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 you do something first. You know, and it's just, it's absurd. And that's why, part of the reason why the political situation is so intractable. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, that's a big question and there's not a good answer for it. <laughs> Um, any other questions? Uh, I mean, hemp is a very incredibly versatile <laughs> plant uh, that can be used for a variety of really useful things, you know, rope, paper, all kinds of textiles, you know, other types of products, um, and it grows really quickly, and it uh, doesn't use up a lot of nutrients in the soil, um, and the United States doesn't like it because it hasn't associated with marijuana, <laughs> and so we haven't used it, and that's the reason why. And it's not for any re and it's not for any good reason. It's just for that reason. Yeah. So we should definitely be using hemp. And in fact, some some uh, indigenous um, organizations or just some indigenous groups are trying to 
you know, increase the hemp growth or like, you know, whatever, increase hemp agriculture in this country because they're not, you know, necessarily beholden to all the same rules and regulations, so. Oh yeah, yes, yes, thank you. Um, the last two lectures are up on the syllabus and on our YouTube channel. So if you missed them or you wanna check them out for notes, um, they're both up there. And this one will be up there shortly, either probably tomorrow or Thursday. Um, I, think, I think that's it, if there's no more questions. Go have a great rest of your Tuesday. <laughs>
obviously we all are familiar with the fires that have been going on in California. Those are inextricably linked to climate change um, from uh, the, just the droughts that have happened. The, uh, the trees are very heat stressed, they're water stressed, and that makes them more vulnerable to diseases and pests like bark beetle. And so they die. And as, when they die, they make perfect fuel for more intense wildfires. And we kind of talked about that last time. Um, we're also going to see with increased precipitation, or so increased evaporation leads to increased precipitation. And then that gives you bigger, stronger storms. And so, for instance, <laughs> Hurricane Ophelia hit Ireland <laughs> in 2017, October 2017, and killed people. I mean, a hurricane in Ireland, when did you ever hear about that? You, you haven't, because it hasn't happened in recorded history. Uh, and then, of course, Hurricane Maria, and we'll, I'll show a little clip of, of some of the aftermath that's still going on. And, you know, it's, it's not just the physical impact of these major storms on, you know, Puerto Rico or Houston or whoever, or wherever. It's, it's, the, it's our response to that as well. And the infrastructure that we have in place to counter that is very revealing about what types of socioeconomic impacts that climate change will have. And then finally, we'll show a little bit about some of the flooding in the Midwest. I mentioned last time that this class was supposed to have two TAs, and one of them is out in, in the Pine Ridge Reservation right now dealing with the flooding and coordinating with the local leaders out there to get FEMA in, because they they're not recognizing it as an emergency, the Trump administration. Um, so this is just a quick video. To sh I wanted to, because we're going to be talking about um, you know, a lot of high-level stuff, a lot of charts and graphs you know, that they are pretty dry. So I, I want to, because climate change is real and it's not an abstract thing like we talked about last time, I wanted to you know, let it kind of hit home. So these are people's experience with climate change. This is like, this is the fire, this is the California fire. And it's a sunny day. <laughs> so climate change is not uh, just you know graphs and figures. It's it's your hometown burning down. It's it's driving through blazing infernos and you know not knowing if you know the place that you're going to is going to burn down next. And it's also uh, not knowing what's going to happen to the infrastructure of the place that you live. I mean, look at I don't know why it's not working. I mean, look at PG&E. PG&E has been driven to bankruptcy by these, these fires because they haven't, and they, they, they have acknowledged that they are running the risk each, more and more each year of starting fires because of climate change. They, the CEO, well, the former CEO, she got kicked out, uh, the former CEO of PG&E after these fires happened, uh, she, was, she admitted that it was climate change. She was trying to kind of blame it, you know, on climate change, but really, we've all known this is coming. And the fact that PG&E hasn't upgraded their infrastructure in accordance to the th increased threat level that they were aware of, you know, is still their liability. And so, you know, it's affecting the, the very, you know, the governor of, the new governor, Governor Newsom, came in and his first thing that he did was try to deal with these wildfires. It's completely taken over the politics of the state. It's, you know, it's taken over a lot of, um, you know, the media discussion in the state right now. So, you know, and this is just, this was one wildfire season. And it's had major impacts, you know, in, in places like, Forbes, which you can't see because this has got cut off for some reason. Um, places like Forbes and uh, Business Insider are saying climate change has caused PG&E to go bankrupt. <laughs> these are not, you know, these are not like liberal fantasy, you know, media outlets. These are these are like mainstream business outlets saying climate change caused the company to go bankrupt. And speaking of bankruptcy, you know, morally and otherwise, here's the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. <laughs> Senator Bill Nelson met with Puerto Rican residents who were displaced from their homes after Hurricane Maria. The group was on Capitol Hill today urging lawmakers to do more to provide affordable housing 
to thousands of families affected by the storm, many of them ending up here in the state of Florida. a Category 4 storm when it made landfall in Puerto Rico last September, plunging the island into a humanitarian crisis. And then we went outside, and it was, I mean, devastation. It was like a bomb was, you know, there. When the storm hit, Vivian Rivera was in the town of Comerillo in the mountainous central part of the island. Her hometown was left unrecognizable by hurricane force winds and torrential rains that turn streams into raging rivers. We just decided to, to take a walk, me and my cousin, and uh, we cried all the way. I mean, it was, ah. Maria was the worst natural disaster ever to hit the U.S. territory. The storm knocked down 80% of the island's power transmission lines. Millions were left with no electricity, cell phone service, medicine, food, or water. We didn't have any water, we didn't have any electricity. So we didn't have a way to communicate with police, uh, our family, uh, I mean, there were no phones, uh, no way to go in the car anywhere because the roads were blocked with, you know, the one slide and the trees and the electric poles. Getting aid to the island proved challenging, but getting the aid out of the capital of San Juan was an almost insurmountable obstacle, leaving Puerto Ricans out of touch with the rest of the world and feeling hopeless and forgotten. It was really scary. It was like we were in another place, you know, like isolated. Maria forced thousands of Puerto Ricans to leave for places like Florida. Vivian lives in Hollywood, but her 89-year-old mother Rosa remains in Puerto Rico, as do other family members who are still dealing with power outages and water shortages. Some days they get up in the morning and they don't have electricity, so the whole day without, without electricity, they you know lose the groceries and stuff, and um, then the next day they, they do have electricity, but they don't have water, so it's like a shudders to think what a new hurricane season will bring to Puerto Rico. If another hurricane comes, I mean, it's going to be gone again. Now, eight months after Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, the death toll remains a real mystery. The official count of deaths on the U.S. territory stands at 64, but a recent Harvard survey says it's more than 4,600. And guys, the uh, government of Puerto Rico uh, is doing a, a study, uh, George Washington University is, is uh, heading it, to really come up with a definitive number. And it's just so scary to think that we're in hurricane season again right now, as they're still trying to recover from last year. That's going to be very difficult. Well. So they, I let it play a little bit at the end there just so that they would bring up the thing about the death toll, you know, because the official count, as they said, you know, is super low. And the, the real count is, I'm sure, higher than the number that they gave because, you know, how do you, how, it's a tricky to account for all those deaths. Doing, you know, where, you know, did you die of a disease that you caught from, you know, some sewage that came out during the flooding? Did you die, you know, during the hurricane, you know, did something hit you in the head? Um, but... And they also mention in the video that, you know, it's not just one hurricane, it's the next hurricane and in the next one. And, you know, how do we deal with the overlapping recovery times, you know, as, as these things become more frequent? And this is the official uh, Trump uh, response to the Hurricane Maria. Hucking paper towels at people's heads. <laughs> I, you know, just because... I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. This is the President of the United States. I don't even want to watch all that. Um, this is the flooding in, Pine, or in, uh, yeah, in, in, in the Lakota Nation right now. So this is, um, this is a video that we just made, that Chris made, <laughs> um, and it just shows a little bit of the flooding that's happened. Because it's not really being covered too much. Submerging a thunderstorm described by meteorologists as a bomb cyclone is blasting parts of the country's midsection. Powerful winds combined with snow are creating blizzard conditions. Flood waters show little sign of dropping off here on Pine Ridge as tribal authorities and outside agencies strive to help community members in distress. This flood has done tremendous damage 
to our public infrastructure, more than a thousand of our families were displaced. On March 29th, South Dakota Senate passed SR7, urging President Trump to declare South Dakota the counties that were impacted and the tribes that were impacted a disaster area. During this time, the tribe has depleted all resources. So we're looking for donations, anything that can help communities addressing immediate needs. So we need people to come here, accountants, bookkeepers, engineers, anybody who has experience, especially with disaster declarations. We, we need to get a disaster declared. We are seeking all the assistance that we can get. We have intense emergency material needs like water, like non-perishable food, like diapers, like hygiene products. So all of those donations mean the world to those of our people who are struggling. I want to thank everybody for coming together in this time of crisis. Please continue to stay with us. Continue to pray. We'll go to And this is uh, Henry Redcloud. He owns Red Cloud Renewables, which is uh, it's Lakota owned, Lakota run renewable energy manufacturing. And um, he got flooded out. And you know, this is this is someone who this is an indigenous man whose land was stolen from his ancestors, who has been heavily impacted by climate change while he's trying to promote renewable energy, which is a solution to climate change. And it's just it's you know, it's heartbreaking. Good morning. We're here on our ninth day now, flooding down here. Uh, as you can see in the background here, a uh, house is totally lost. It's underwater. Uh, we got, I'm guessing, about six to eight inches, maybe ten inches inside the house. Uh, it, it's one of the houses here on a compound here at Red Cloud Renewable. A total of five houses have got submerged like this. Uh, everything has been lost, um, and uh, it's just a, it's a, a terrible time for us here, you know, today, as well as numerous people here on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation here. The whole community, uh, the, the township, everything, it affects everything. Uh, the family here, Avery, my son, his family, his three daughters, and pregnant wife once resided here and they can't access anything in there. We were, they were evacuated out eight days ago when this flooding came in. It's deep, Congo, that's why we can't go into the house. I imagine things are all lost in there. We lost homes, we're gonna have to bring homes back here again to number four. For our family, you know, we, we need to know how all the other families are doing out there too. We haven't heard from some of them. So many people affected and people got sick and died from this too, you know, because they couldn't get out of their house and get to the safe place to be rescued. Uh, we're going to continue on. We're going to rebuild. We're going to rebuild stronger and we're going to continue on bringing clean energy forward so we don't have this happen. Thank you for helping and donating to us because I know we're going to need help. Being the elder here on a compound with my family, my wife, my, my children, my grandchildren, it really devastates me. It makes me feel really bad to see this, to see all the flooding and everything that's happening here. But, you know, nevertheless, with your support and our partnerships, we can overcome this and we can make sure that nothing like this happens ever again to us as well as other people too. So if you 
are interested in knowing Henry or, uh, or you know, helping him out, um, you can contact him through us or you, know, you can reach him through his, his PayPal. Um, we've done some work with him as well. Um, and so here he is again, Henry Redcloud, on the headline of an Intercept article. Trump pushes a new pipeline permit as floods devastate Native American tribes. He, he's trying to re-re-re-revive Keystone XL and push it through their lands again. And not only that, he just signed something yesterday. He signed an executive order to, to take away states' rights to block pipeline construction. So he's making it harder for states to do the things that, they, that the Lakota people did at Standing Rock and try to stand up to the pipeline. I mean, yes, that was ultimately unsuccessful, but... Well, they better be. This was yesterday. This was like last night that uh, that I saw this. So, <laughs> um, they they should be fighting it because it's it's com it's a complete overreach. Anyway, so now we can start to talk about or now, now that we've seen uh, the, the the current effects of climate change and how devastating and heartbreaking they truly are, we can start to really think about the future impacts in in the proper context because you know these aren't just charts and figures and numbers. These are people's lives. These are people's homes and their grandchildren and their businesses. <laughs> and so when we're talking about uh, predictions, we have to talk about how we make predictions. You know, how, how do you predict the future? Uh, last time I used the example of gravity acting on a falling pen to demonstrate the inevitability of climate change. Uh, but how did you know that the pen was going to fall and hit the table when I dropped it? I mean, how, how did this pigeon know that the bus wasn't going to hit it? <laughs> you, you, you've seen pens fall before. You've seen things fall before. You, the, the pigeon's probably seen a bus before, and it's like, it, you know, it's, it's 9.30, uh, it's coming around the corner, I'll be fine right here, you know? I mean, that's a joke. But um, you, basically, you're creating a conceptual model in your head based on prior experiences that you've had with, you know, your environment around you, with reality. So taking the, the idea of the pen again, if you were to measure you know, how fast the pen fell, how far it fell, the weight of the pen, you know, different things like that, you could attach numbers to your conceptual model of, you know, like when I drop the pen, it falls. That's your conceptual model, but you can attach numbers to that. You can create a numerical model. And with a lot more testing and you know, poking and prodding and a little bit of you know, coding, you could program that conceptual and numerical model into a computer and have it calculate the exact trajectory of a pen that was falling anywhere in the world of any size, you know, at any trajectory. And so that's the power of models, you know, and they're based off of things that we can see and that, you know, you can measure, um, and they will, we refine them over time, and that's, that's what climate scientists do when they're building a climate model, is they take things like, like the planetary orbits, you know, the Milankovitch cycles, which, which we talked about last time, the eccentricity of the planet, its ubiquity and precession, they take things like uh, the transmittance of electromagnetic radiation at the top of the atmosphere. This should look familiar from last time. We've got the, uh, the infrared absorption band right here. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, they take things like the energy balance of the Earth. You know, this, this conceptual model, this numeric model, they plug it all together with things like the carbon cycle and other biogeochemical cycles, other uh, ecological processes. So just a lot of different things, they take it and they model it for you know, a square unit of, of planet. And they repeat that for the entire planet and each layer of the atmosphere, because different layers of the atmosphere behave differently. They model it for layers of the ocean, because layers of the ocean behave differently. So, and models are typically, once they're all built, models are typically spun up by running uh, climate data that we already have through them, you know, through the past. So we, we start them off in the past and we catch them up to the future and see how well they predicted what we, what we know happened. And once you do that, you get a few iterations, a few thousand, a few million, whatever, then your model is starting to look pretty good because it can predict what actually happened in the world. And so then you can say, well, if it could predict what happened in the past, it could probably predict what's going to happen in the future, right? Um, and so these things have developed over decades now, and they started off, you know, pretty simplistically, you know, I mean, you could take the idea of a falling pen, you know, and then you turn it into something that you could calculate the trajectory of rockets around the planet. I mean, it's the same idea, it's the same model of gravity. And that's what these are, you know, the, this, this is basically showing from the, the mid-1970s up until the fifth uh, IPCC report, which came out in 2013, 2014. 
they've added a tremendous amount of complexity to these models. You know, they're, they're getting down to land, ice, atmospheric chemistry, dynamic vegetation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these models are good. They're really good. And um, we can predict a lot of things. We can make a lot of very accurate predictions that we've measured, on, measured against uh, data that we've collected about you know, the climate in the last you know, 20, 30 years, whatever. Um, but there's some things that we can predict better than others. Um, because they're just, it's a more direct consequence of an increase of gr greenhouse gas emissions, right? So things like a decrease in the amount of extreme cold days. We, I mean, you know, as the planet gets hotter, it's going to have hotter days, too. Um, and that probably means more drought as things get hotter. And, uh, you know, maybe more boom and bust rainfall cycles. But, you know, things like sev severe convective storms, wildfires, these are things that we know are going to happen with climate change, um, but we just can't say exactly how far. You know, we can't say there's a, you know, 27% chance there's going to be a, you know, 500-year wildfire in, you know, California next year. We, we, we can't say that with, you know, pr with extreme certainty, but we do know that wildfires are linked to climate change. All models are wrong, <laughs> but some are useful. And that goes for beyond just climate models that you know, we're going to be talking about today. It, it goes for every model that you carry around in your head, consciously or unconsciously, about other people, about you know, the way that gravity works or the way that pens fall. And so we have to, in climate science and just in our personal lives, you know, in order to have a useful model that can accurately predict reality, because that's what we live in, right? We need to underline or examine the underlying assumptions. You need to verify it against real world data, and you need to be constantly iterating that process of adjusting your model when new information is found. So our models are extremely good, and as computing power increases and gets better, a bunch of you know, smart people continue to think about this problem very, very hard. Uh, these, these models are just going to get better and better. So the information that I'm presenting you today, a lot of it is several years old because the IPCC reports take several years to come out. They take about six years to write on average. Um, so keep, keep that in mind as I'm showing you all this because some of these data have changed since, since, the, the, since they came out. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about that as well. So once you get your model built, you need to have your inputs. You, know, you, need, to, you need to get the ball rolling, so to speak. And, so with these climate models, um, climate scientists, and particularly those at the IPCC, have settled on these what are called relative concentration pathways, RCPs. And that's just different uh, scenarios of em carbon emissions. So, you know, uh, say we were to basically immediately start ramping down our carbon emissions tomorrow. Never going to happen. But if we did, this is, this is what our carbon emissions would look like over time. If we were to do, you know, a pretty good job, this is what they could look like. If we did, you know, kind of a, a moderate job, we could maybe, you know, end up here. Business as usual is the red line. And so that's what would happen if we just kept doing what we're doing, you know, pumping pipelines through indigenous territories, pumping out tar sands from Canada, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, building entire in global military industrial complexes to protect our oil interests. <laughs> Think about all the money we could save. Um, and so this is a, a huge <laughs> table, but I just wanted to concentrate your attention on uh, this particular section here. So these are, this is a breakdown, and you can study this. So all the, these lectures uh, are going to be on the syllabus. Um, the first one is already uploaded. Uh, this one will be uploaded after today. Um, so you can take a look at this in more depth. It's also available uh, on the IPCC reports. Uh, but basically, this is showing that uh, with a CO2 concentration of 450 parts per million, we have less than a 50% chance of staying below 1.5 degrees C by the end of the century. So the very you know, fastest we could possibly do where we're cutting out our carbon emissions tomorrow, we may still not make it under 1.5 degrees C. But we have to try, you know, because it's, it's, it scales, right? You know, it's, it's proportional. The more carbon and other greenhouse gases we pump into the atmosphere, the worse climate change is going to be. So just because you know, we don't have a great chance of staying below 1.5 degrees C warming doesn't mean that we should just give up. Because we've got a pretty good chance of staying below 2 degrees C warming, and that's still extremely significant. Um, but we're at 411.91 parts per million of CO2 right now. So 
Compare that against the 450 that we need to stay, to have a, a good chance of staying below 2 degrees C. We're pretty close. And in fact, a lot of these models account for that. They account for an overshoot. So, and that's, that's kind of one of the flaws, you could say, with, with these models, is that they do kind of allow for this, this, this you know, savior technology or something. You know, some, we figure out something that we can start to you know, pull carbon out of the air. And you know, that's probably, hopefully, if you know, we can do anything about it, soil carbon sequestration, because that's just kind of the best and cheapest option. Um, but you know, we'll see what happens. So now that you can understand how these predictions are made, we can start moving into the actual predictions, because now you can have some confidence in how these numbers are arrived at. Um, so first, we're going to be talking about kind of the most basic thing that we can predict with climate change, is that things are going to get hotter. <laughs> And so here's uh, you know, similar thing, a similar graph to the last one, uh, except this is the, the change in radiative forcing. So that's that energy balance of the Earth, right? And as you put in more energy, you have to equal it out with the amount of energy that comes out of the Earth, otherwise you get climate change, right? We went over that last time. Um, so this is showing what the radiative forcing changes is going to be in, at the top of the atmosphere under the different conditions. And it's, as you can see, very, very high under the business as usual scenario, so we probably avoid that. Um, and then that results in a global surface temperature change, I'll wait for that to go away, um, of you know, anywhere from 6 to 12 degrees centigrade, and which is like, just multiply that by 1.8 for <laughs> Fahrenheit. Um, but another thing to really notice about this, uh, the, this graph here, especially this bottom one, is that these, these, these fuzzy bits, the uncertainty associated with each prediction, gets larger and larger the more greenhouse gas emissions we put out into the atmosphere. So we have a pretty good idea that if we cut our carbon emissions right now, you know, we'll be safe, like, you know, we'll be good. But the more carbon and other greenhouse gases we put in the atmosphere, we just don't know what's going to happen. We're, we're, we're pushing the system past a point that we've never seen before. Well, or have we? We'll talk about that in a second. Um, so, but these, these temperature changes, uh, and I alluded to this last time, they're not geographically distributed evenly across the globe. Um, they're concentrated primarily at the poles, and so what this picture is showing uh, is, are the different scenarios here. So the RCP 2.6 is the lowest one, the medium one, slightly higher, and then the highest one going down. Uh, and uh, increasing in time as you move from left to right. So, 2065, 2100, 2200. So over the next 200 years, this is, this is showing the temperature increases uh, predicted for the planet. And one thing you can see down here in the business as usual scenario is the Arctic gets really hot. It's like a 13 degrees C increase, which is, uh, I don't know, something like you know, 25, something, 20, 25 degrees Fahrenheit about there. That's really hot for, you know, like, the Arctic Circle. <laughs> it really shouldn't be that warm, and that has major consequences for, you know, nutrient cycling, uh, ocean currents, air currents, you know, just all the life that lives there as well. Um, and it, you can break it down even further, because uh, we, we can do finer and fire, finer scale models as our computing power increases, and we can shrink that grid on the planet, you know, when we're, we're building our models. And so we can actually do it, you know, now for you know, the just one part of one continent, you know, for, for example, the United States. And so here's the predicted temperature changes for the early 21st century and the late 21st century under the two, two different scenarios, the kind of medium one and the business as usual. And it gets hot. It gets about, you know, eight to nine degrees hotter throughout most of the United States by the end of the century under the business as usual scenario. And we can break it down even further now because our computing power and our satellite technology has gotten really good that we can actually break it down by almost you know, like a county level basis about where, what's going to get hotter. Um, and so this, well, actually, so this, this particular one um, is showing temperature changes that have already happened, <laughs> but we can model these out as well. So Southern California is warming up a lot faster than Northern California. And you know, that's, a, that's a function of the environment that's there. Um, you know, it's, Southern California is largely desert. Northern California is mostly forest. So they have different albedos, they have different you know, hydrogeologic cycles and things like that. And so those types of microclimates um, are going to be really important when climate change uh, yeah, it accelerates. Yes? Can these models like, sort of account for, did you said that it goes through natural like, warming water cycles? Yes. So do they, I guess, take into account sort of maybe some natural climate change in the next few years 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, the last time, I don't know if you remember, uh, we were talking about radiative uh, or uh, climate forcings. Um, so things like solar irradiance, volcanic eruptions, you know, solar uh, like sunspot cycles, things like that. Um, so those are all, and you know, the, the, the orbital mechanics of the planet as it moves around the sun and wobbles back and forth. So those are all things that we know and we understand very well, and they are absolutely incorporated into these models. So, I mean, these things are, I just want to like, impress upon you how incredibly complicated <laughs> these things are. You know, they take teams of hundreds of people to build and to understand and to, you know, to, to work with. And um, yeah, so chances are, if you can you know, think of something, you know, one of these people have thought about it as well, which I find reassuring. <laughs> yeah. Last class, we talked about the jet stream and how it's going to become yes. easier. Mm -hmm. Like up here? Extreme, yeah, more extreme temperature changes? Or yeah, so it's, it's um, we'll talk about ocean circulation um, in, in, a, in a, a little bit later today, um, but just as a preview, it causes warming and cooling because it, it, ocean currents carry heat around the planet. And so if you break down those heat conveyor belts, then your heat isn't able to be distributed as evenly throughout the planet. So it's, it's, it's a little bit of both. And in fact, you can kind of see, um, that the southeastern United States has actually been observed to be cooling a little bit because it gets hit from that Gulf Stream, which comes down the coast and kind of wraps around the Gulf of Mexico there. Um, so as the planet heats up, it's not just you know, uniformly getting hotter, right? It's, it is geographically varied. It varies based on microclimates, but it also varies based on time. Um, and over time, the number of warm days is predicted to increase. And that's just, well, I mean, obviously, if the days are going to get hotter, then they have to get hotter sometime during the day. And it's probably not going to be at night when the sun's not shining. Um, but also, the number of cold days decrease. And this is, you know, uh, again, something that you would predict, you know, just common sense. But it has really important implications for things like agriculture, for things like, you know, any, any plant or animal that relies on seasonal cues. When those seasonal cues shift, then the species have, are, are, are impacted. You know, they may not be able to catch up. They may not be able to migrate in time or in space uh, to match up what they need out of the environment with the changes that are happening to it. And so as the number of warm days increase, the number of cold days decrease, uh, the amount of moisture in the soil is also going to change because it's related to how hot it is, also how much it rains, which is also changing. Uh, and so these are the four different scenarios, you know, from low, medium to high um, across, the, across the whole planet. You can see that soil moisture, uh, you know, in the next hundred years under the highest emission scenario is going to drop precipitously um, for large amounts of what are now forests, you know. So like a lot of the rainforest is going to have a lot less soil moisture, which means that plants can't grow as much. The, all the organisms in the soil that rely on that moisture to live and to you know, do what they do that is so important to the environment uh, are not going to be able to function as well. And as it gets hotter, I mean, you, know, you have human impacts as well, like melting pavements in India. You have Indian farmers committing suicide because their crops have completely failed and they have no way of supporting their families and they are hopeless. The, India has seen a massive uh, skyrocket in, in their suicide rate because of the droughts and the heat famine, or the, the famines and things like that that have resulted. Um, and this is drought in Namibia, desertification, and, or sorry, Nigeria. And then uh, the second largest lake in Bolivia, Lake Popoa, has disappeared. <laughs> it's just gone. It's it disappeared over about the last 50, 60 years. And, you know, of course, the communities, the fishing communities that rely on the lake, the fish in the lake, they just have nowhere to go. You know, what do they do? Where do they rely on? They just have to leave. They have to become climate migrants, <laughs> which is something that is going to happen to a lot of people. And it's not just people that are going to be climate migrants. It's also <laughs> things like trees. You know, you wouldn't think of, you know, a tree being a climate migrant because it can't move. But over time, species population or species uh, distribution changes. And uh, they often change in response to environmental conditions. But when they happen, uh, when, they, when environmental conditions change too rapidly, uh, plants and animals aren't able to keep up a lot of the time. And so this, what this is showing, this is uh, from the Canadian Forestry Service, um, but it shows 
the current climate suitability zone of aspen trees. So these are, you know, a really important tree for a lot of Canada uh, and United States um, forests uh, ecology. Um, over the next 100 years, uh, under the business as usual scenario, basically all of the aspen in the United States, in the continental United States, is going to disappear. It's going to die off because it's it's going to get too hot. It's going to get too dry. Um, and even in, in a lot in Canada, it's it's going to continue to shift. And you know, th this isn't just like you know a few people getting up and walking. This is an entire ecosystem getting up and moving. And you know, can it do it fast enough? What happens to the things that can't move with you know as the trees move? Do they die off? You know, what and you know what happens when the trees move to a new place or you know or they're they're in a place where the climate changes, it gets hotter, it gets drier, they get stressed, and then they become more susceptible to things like bark beetle, which is a huge problem for California and a lot of the continental United States because uh, it kills trees and it leaves them looking like that, which leaves them, you know, uh, perfect fuel for massive intense wildfires, which are way crazier than they've been in the past because of there's so much more fuel available. And it's not just trees, it's, you know, things that live in the ocean. Um, they're a little bit more mobile <laughs> than trees, of course, but, and, and, and because of that, you can track their movement uh, on, you know, smaller timescales. Um, and that's exactly what this is showing here. So this is a bunch of different species from around the globe, and uh, scient groups of scientists have been tracking them, and they can see that just all these different species are moving in response to changing environmental conditions due to climate change, <coughs> including things like frogs, which are experiencing a massive die-off right now. And it's, they're kind of our canary in the coal mine. It's, they're dying off due to a chytrid fungus, but their susceptibility to the fungus and the fungus's proliferation may be linked to climate change, you know, and to the, to the stress the frogs are, uh, are dealing with as things get hotter and drier, because they're amphibians. They need moisture. They need cool, damp places. So uh, I, I talked a little bit about, you know, the changing cold days affecting seasonal patterns, um, and we're going to, uh, and, and changing rainfall patterns. And how does that work? Well, so as you get a uh, warmer atmosphere, you get more evaporation. And as you get more evaporation, you get more clouds and rainfall and things like that. Um, and so that causes shifts in where rainfall occurs around the globe. And you know, if you don't have rainfall for a few years, you are going to drought. And then you can't grow crops. And then and your entire population has to move. <laughs> um, and that also affects the distribution and the frequency of, of major storms like cyclones and hurricanes. And so what this is showing is the frequency of tropical cyclones. So here's the little legend here. Um, all, so number one, so the first kind of column here is all tropical cyclone frequency. So how many cyclones and hurricanes are happening in a year. Um, the category or the frequency of category four or five tropical storms. So, you know, hurricanes, are they getting more frequent or less frequent? The lifetime maximum intensity, how intense is each storm on average getting? And then the rate of precipitation, so how much rain is it dumping? And that's something that's really important, as we saw with Hurricane Harvey in Texas. Um, and as you can see, around the globe, it's interesting that the number or the, the, the frequency of major storms is actually decreasing. It's predicted to keep decreasing, but we're going to have bigger, more intense, more, uh, more damaging storms. So they have more rainfall, they are, they're more intense winds, um, but they just come less frequently. <laughs> so, you know. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's probably a bad thing because it's much harder to recover from a big storm than it is from a smaller storm, even if the smaller storm only comes every other year. Um, and with those storm surges come flooding. And uh, so this is a, a chart showing the predicted changes in flooding frequency around the world. And so what it's looking at here is a 100-year a, a flood. So it's, it's the, 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 the magnitude of flood that occurs on average once every 100 years. You know, is that, that particular size flood, is that happening more frequently or less frequently? And the blue is showing that it's happening more frequently in a lot of the places around the world. Um, and in fact, you know, 100-year floods are dropping to every other year in some places, and they will continue to drop. And with changing rainfall patterns and flooding patterns and things like that, you get changes in groundwater recharge. And you know, I think a lot of people aren't really aware of how important a resource groundwater is, but basically we wouldn't have 
agriculture in California without our use of groundwater. We use a massive amount of groundwater, and you know, California kind of feeds the nation. Um, the, the, the vast majority of groundwater that we use, we use for agriculture. So a lot of it we use for <laughs> pumping out oil and gas, or you know, we pollute it when we pump dirty water from oil and gas extraction back underground into the aquifers. Um, and then you know, we use a small amount of that for drinking. Uh, <laughs> And so you can see that a lot of the, the aquifers around the world are at high risk uh, of depletion due to climate change. And that's just because they're not being recharged or people are drawing out the water faster than it can be used because of increased evapotranspiration rates in their, their fields. And you know, the, the plants respire faster. They, they suck water out of the, the ground faster when it's hotter. So you have to water them more. And uh, also impacting agriculture are changes in seasons. Right, so I, I alluded to that earlier, but you know things like like apple trees are you know they need a, a cold snap, right? You know they need like they need some 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 trigger that lets them know on a genetic level it's time to start flowering. Spring or you know spring is sprung, <laughs> and I need to get out there. Um, and those those signals are changing for plants and animals, and that's what this is showing here. This is uh, predicted adult mortality rates, birth rates, and maturation rates uh, of different animals and plants around the world. So in temperate zones and Mediterranean zones and tropical zones. And basically adult mortality rates uh, as temperature increases, um, so it's going up here, as temperature increases, adult, mor adult mortality rates will increase. So the adults will die more, uh, the birth rate will go down, and the rate at which uh, the species matures will go down because more young will be dying as well. And why does that happen? Well, I mean, for some of the reasons that you can imagine, right? You know, I, if you are a migratory bird, for instance, and you are flying in from you know, Mexico to California, and uh, you're, you're hoping for a nice, tasty caterpillar on one of the trees but, uh, for, your, for your young, but that caterpillar has already turned into a butterfly and flown away because it got the seasonal cue here you know, two weeks earlier than it did 20 years ago. And now you're there and you've laid your eggs and you, you're, you're, you're hungry, chicks are on the way and you have no food for them. <laughs> what do you do? Well, what do you do? You can't carry the egg. <laughs> um, so, you know, these things have, have cascading consequences uh, across things that you couldn't, you know, you couldn't necessarily picture at first glance. Um, so next, you know, the melting of the ice caps. Uh, and this is something that's very important uh, when it comes to sea level rise, obviously, but um, there's a difference between uh, sea-based glaciers and land-based glaciers, and I mean, obviously, the difference is right there in the name, but they have major differences when it comes to uh, things like sea level rise. And uh, 